six months before Ramadan started. And they would ask Allah, O Allah, commit me to Ramadan. O Allah, commit Ramadan to me and receive it from me with acceptance. And then six months after Ramadan ended, they would ask Allah to accept everything that they did during the month of Ramadan. That's how serious of a month, or that's how blessed of a month is that, or that Ramadan is. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to welcome Ramadan into our lives. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to reach Ramadan because there's many people, and I'm sure we all know of someone who has already passed away since the last Ramadan. I know at least one person. Um, and so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to reach Ramadan and allow us to benefit from, from Ramadan and to experience the blessings of Ramadan. I mean. So, <clears throat> the goal for this workshop is to transform our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through fasting, to realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy upon us, and to come closer to Him before, during, and after Ramadan. It's a pretty big goal. So I'm going to try as hard as I can to get you to that point, and I hope you walk away feeling um, ready for Ramadan when it comes, inshallah. So, just a quick, I think, overview or agenda of what we're going to talk about for today. So I'll, I'll do some introductions. I'll introduce myself to you all. We'll talk a little bit about Shabbat, the month that we are currently in. And then we'll talk about Ramadan, the fiqh of Ramadan, some practical prep for Ramadan, spirituality. And then if we get to it, charity and dua. Um, for those of you who got the slides, you know there's like close to 100 slides at this point. So we'll see how we're... <laughs> I think my wife knows, Asra knows... Uh, they, some of the folks know that I go uh, a little too intense on slides. So we will try to get through what we get through, and then inshallah, whatever we don't get through, it's fine. Um, but I'll try to focus on the important stuff. So about me. Um, I started studying Hanafi Fiqh um, back in 2017, and it was a time in my life where things were really difficult, and things were just kind of crazy. and so. A few, I started studying in October of 2017, and prior to that, a few months before that, Bawakya, which is the big um, institute in this area that teaches people Arabic, they um, held a, an intensive, a one-day intensive on like the essentials of Islam. And my teacher was teaching at that, his name is Sheikh Sohail Lahir, and you know, he was teaching at, teaching his portion of Hanafi Fiqh, and then after that, we had the opportunity to continue studying with him after that. So for three years, I didn't bring the book here with me that we studied, but for three years we studied Hanafi Fiqh, starting from February 9th of um, 2018, I believe. Or sorry, we were studying it from October of 2017 until February 9th of 2020, or February 9th of 2020. Um, at that moment, my teacher, Sheikh Sadal, had a stroke. And alhamdulillah, he's fine, but I remember when he had a stroke that morning, I cried that morning because it was heartbreaking. And it was like kind of like this thing that was a part of my life, that I was a part of my life when I was going through really difficult parts of my life, things that were really good in my life. You know, it was this like constant that was always there. And I was scared he was gonna die. Like I was legitimately scared that I was gonna lose access to this beloved teacher of mine. I'm like, he, 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 he was able to recover and he's still recovering. And so we spent part of 2020, 2021, 2022, we would just read the book with him. He was like rebuilding his like, like speech, and we were just helping him like re reading the text and stuff like that, and continuing on. Um, and inshallah, this year I think later we're going to continue studying the text. But I think a couple of lessons that you can kind of take away from that experience, from what I'm sharing with you, is that it's really important when you get opportunities to learn, especially with scholars, not of which I am not. You don't pass up those opportunities because you don't know if you'll get that opportunity again in your life. And then it's also important that whatever we do in Islam, and Islam talks about this all the time, it's to do consistent acts that are, even if they're small, just to do something consistently. And have this thing that is yours, that you cherish, and is consistent and small, that keeps you connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the final thing I'll mention is to always make dua for your teachers, make, make prayers for your teachers and the people that are teaching you things. So that's just a couple things that I wanted to share with y'all. Um, I professionally, I work in IT for the federal government. I manage um, enterprise systems for the judicial branch. 
um, as some people know, you have more than one. Um, I, ha I, I, I don't know even know how I got into this field, but yeah, it's been good from love. So I will ask you guys a question. Are you ready for Ramadan? Feel free to share. Like what is, what are you looking forward to? What are you guys excited about? What are you scared about? What are the things that we can help you with? But are you ready for Ramadan? Does anyone want to share? Can I just complete the Quran? Okay, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. Yeah. Um, I feel inshallah ready. Um, I just want to make the most out of it because that like one, there were a few years in my life where I would read the Quran, but I was like, yeah. Um, and then I was like, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to try to actually read, and maybe even with translation. So I, I'm an Arabic speaker, but sometimes I yeah. feel like we're on Arabic. It's a yeah. Standard Arabic is more difficult to understand. Um, but like maybe, you know, with translation, actually like take it in. And I never got to doing that. So hopefully this one will allow to try to understand. We'll talk a little bit about goal setting and stuff a little bit later. Um, I think for me personally, I'm looking forward to like the community aspect of it. Like I think there's just a buzz and there's like a, I can't describe that feeling, but it's just like a buzz around the You know, you see people you have, you, you, you see people you maybe haven't seen for a whole year and there's like a communal aspect to it that I think is really cool. Anyone else want to share before we go? I don't feel that I'm really ready. Uh, it's my don't be my first Ramadan. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I, I also look forward to the communal aspect, the Tarawi, and I really look forward to it. And I know I will not be able to read all of the Quran as much as I can with translations. So. All right. Um, so, a couple things I'll mention up front here. Like, I will try to answer your questions as best as I can, but I'm not a scholar. I am just someone who studied a little bit. So I may defer some questions to Imam Zia or your local Imam or stuff like that, um, but I'll try. That's kind of my commitment to you. Um, if I say I don't know, it's not that I don't want to answer your question, I do, but sometimes I just know where my place is in the, in the, on this side of things, so I don't want to, I don't want to overstep my bounds because I think there's, I think, I think it's important to know where we are in our own um, knowledge and, and, and journey. So we, like I mentioned, and we're, I'm gonna try and go, so the first break will be in, at Maghrib time. So I'm gonna go for maybe about 40 minutes and then we'll take a break from Maghrib and then after that we'll continue on from there. Um, we're currently in the month of Shaban. Um, there's a really famous book, it's called Lathad al-Ma'arif. It basically talks about the virtues of all of the Islamic months and it's been translated, the translated translation isn't the best. I think there's some group that's working on like an updated translation of that book. But one of the things that's mentioned about Shaban is this story that when the month of Shaban entered, Amr ibn al Qais would close his entire business. He would shut it down. And he would devote himself to the Quran and he would say, glad tidings for the one who rectified himself before Ramadan came. And so it kind of shows the importance of prepping our hearts, our minds, and our bodies for Ramadan because, like I mentioned earlier, we, we get this opportunity, we can show we get this opportunity to experience the month of Ramadan. And we may not get this opportunity again for the rest of our lives. There's many people who passed away. I have an uncle who passed away a couple months ago. And, you know, we don't get that, we don't know if we'll have that opportunity again. And so it's really important for us to be able to prepare for that month. Um, this is really long, but I'll mention here one of the, I really like this post that Imam Suhaib Webb um, posted on Instagram the other day, where basically he said, um, when expecting a guest, we naturally tend to our homes, prepare delightful meals, and ensure we are neatly dressed. In similar vein, a very special guest, the month of Ramadan is about to grace us with its presence. It is essential that we welcome this blessed month with the same enthusiasm and preparation we would offer a noble guest. And the best preparation for Ramadan is to cultivate taqwa. We'll talk a lot about taqwa today, so we'll get back to that. Start now, don't wait for the month to begin. And taqwa encompasses four key elements. So the first thing that he mentions in order to prepare yourself for the Ramadan is to start turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking for forgiveness. And I think that's really important for us to recognize the place that Allah has in our life and where we may be today in terms of our hearts 
where our heart may be, the sins that we've done over the past year, we begin to ask a lot for forgiveness. That way, we prepare to take advantage of this month. And then he mentioned abandoning evil. He says here, resist the whispers of your nuts that tempt you if you can stop when Ramadan starts. Um, basically, you know, people sometimes, um, like let's say for example, you smoke, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna stop when Ramadan comes, it'll be fine. Like, I have no issue with that. And, you know, you, you get to Ramadan and it's really hard. And so you, tr you have to start abandoning those things in the lead up to Ramadan to make it easier for you. The other part of this, um, or sorry, and then the next one is fulfilling obligations. So why delay acts that bring you closer to Allah? Procrastination and obedience indicates profound doubts about Allah's mercy and unwarranted reliance on the fleeting pleasures of this world. I think that one is pretty self-explanatory. Make sure that you're starting to get in the habit of praying regularly, um, you know, reducing sin, things like that. The last one here is forgiveness, and I think this is really important. There are relationships that we have in our lives where we may not be as close to the people that we want to be as close to. Sorry, I think something just happened here. Um, and so it's really important for us to resolve those differences that we have with family members, resolve those differences that we may have with friends, try to resolve those disagreements ahead of Ramadan. Because this shows that you know you're that you care about them, you care about your own heart, you want to make sure that. Um, that you're not walking into Ramadan with any grudges. Uh, we actually passed the 15th of Shaban, which was last, last Saturday, but one of the hadith uh, that talk about the benefits of the 15th of Shaban is that Allah Subh'ala looks at all of his creation on that night, and he forgives everyone except someone who has this grudge in their heart. And so it's really important in the lead up to Ramadan that we try to reconcile those differences because again, we don't want to go into Ramadan with that. And I thought this post from Imam Sahib was probably the most succinct thing that you can do um, for Ramadan, but I'll mention a couple other things. Um, I think what's really nice about this is you're kind of looking at Ramadan as this guest that's coming into your life, right? And you want to make sure that you prepare for that guest and you honor that guest and you do whatever you can to make that guest welcome in your life and you are and you take advantage of the time with that with that guest as well. So this talks a lot about like the um, spiritual side of preparing for Ramadan, but I think there's also some practical components as well. I know a lot of people, for example, during lead up to Ramadan will prepare food and freeze it so they don't have to spend like all of their time in the kitchen trying to make meals. Um, some people will change around their work schedule, like for myself, um, where we have to go back into work 50%. So I have asked my manager, um, hey look, like that's really hard, I'm going to do maybe like 40%. But I'll still, I'll still, um, I'll still, I'll still take care of my work. So do what you can to prepare yourself to maximize on the bond as much as Kind of whether again that's freezing food, whether that's having a conversation with your boss about like changing around your work schedule or whatever, make sure you do those things ahead of time. And we get to Ramadan. So Ramadan inshallah will start like, next week on Monday, I think, depending on like means and all that stuff, if that's what you follow in your community. Ramadan. So are you guys I don't know if folks are familiar with like the way Arabic words are kind of constructed, but Arabic words have, a, have root letters associated with them. And so Ramadan has the root letters of Ra, Mim, and La. And then root letters also combine to create other new words. So there's Ramadan and Ram, Ramba, as an example here. So Ramadan is a word that's taken from the root word of Ramad, which is the first word that's listed there at the bottom, and it means to intensely heat something, to, to heat something up like a lot with the sun. And the Arabs, they used to say that the sheep were getting burned while they were raising, while they were grazing in the scorching heat of the sun to the extent that, you know, sometimes they would get like a little bit of damage to their skin and stuff. Imam Qurtubi, he said that this month of Ramadan is called Ramadan because it 
burns the sins of righteous people. It heats the sins up to such an extent that you are left coming out of this month with no sins. Why do you guys think that is? Why is Ramadan burning away our sins? And I think some of you, if you have the slides, you probably can look a little bit ahead, but why do you think Ramadan burns away the sins of people? It's okay if you want to know. I think maybe from like the intensity of like all the worship that you're doing, the fasting, the praying of Dawes, like yeah. the intensity of all those acts of worship are a means of like your sins being forgiven. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, so try to try to follow me on this on this for a second. So Abdullah bin Masood reported that a man kissed a woman, and then he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he mentioned it to him. And so then this verse was revealed. So when this, when this man came to the Prophet and said, hey, I did something wrong, Allah immediately sent this verse to the Prophet and he said, establish prayer, O Prophet, at both ends of the day, in the, in the early part of the night. Surely good deeds wipe out evil deeds. That is a reminder for the mindful. Again, there's a reference here to taqwa. And so the man said, <laughs> he goes, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is this only for me? Like this verse was revealed for me by, by myself? And the Prophet ﷺ said, it is for all who act upon it from my nation. So what Allah is saying, telling us in this verse is a principle that when you do good deeds, it gets rid of your bad deeds. So when we talk about Ramadan, like burning away your good deeds, it's because, huh? Burning away your bad deeds. Or sorry, burning away your bad deeds, sorry. Um, actually, let me mention one quick thing about this. I love this story for a couple of reasons. The first is that the man isn't mentioned. You don't know who this guy is, who, who did this act. And that shows us that we have to protect the identity of those who we've witnessed maybe do something wrong. It's not our place to like, you know, go out and broadcast to the world like, oh, so-and-so did this and this. And unfortunately with social media, like, you have the opportunity to do that. And then the set, so I so that's the first thing I love about this story is that we don't know who this guy is. The second thing is that, like I mentioned earlier, good deeds wipe out evil deeds, and that's through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it didn't need to be like that. We could have came on the day of judgment with like these massive books of deeds and we would have been held to account for it, but we have an opportunity in this light to do good things and every bad thing that we do um, is, is 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 wiped out as a result of that. What? And so, now we, we mentioned that good deeds wipe out evil deeds. What does that have to do with Ramadan? The Prophet ﷺ said, O oh people, a great month has come to you, a blessed month, a month in which a night is, a month in which a night is better than a thousand months, a month in which Allah has made it compulsory upon you to fast by day and voluntary to pray by night. Whoever draws near to Allah by performing any of the optional good deeds in this month shall receive the same reward as performing an obligatory deed at any other time. And whoever discharges an obligatory deed in this month shall receive the reward of performing 70 obligations at any other time. It is the month of patience, and the reward of the, patience is, reward of the patient is heaven. It is a month of charity, and, the month, and, and a month in which the believer's sustenance is increased. And, and the hadith continues, but the important part I want to focus on here is that for every good deed that you do in Ramadan, you are getting a minimum of 70 good deeds as a result of it. And so that's how all the bad deeds that you're doing get burned away. Because you have such an opportunity to do so much good during this month. And we have this opportunity, it's, and it's coming and Allah allow us to see it. So Allah SWT also says in the Quran, yeah. And for those of you who were here last night, this is going to be a little bit of a review because we, we covered these eyes yesterday. But Allah SWT says, O oh, believers. And so he's talking to us. He's mentioning our faith and connecting with us when it, in this ayah. And then he says, fasting is prescribed for you. So the connection here is that with faith, 
comes action. Faith necessitates action. There are certain things that we have to do if we say that we believe. And then Allah says, fasting was prescribed for you as it was for those who were before you. Fasting is not new to Islam. You know, when you get those questions about, like, oh, you guys don't even drink water? Like, it's like, fasting is not something new. Allah gave, Allah made fasting obligatory on every nation before us. Every nation that came before us, fasting was required. The, the means, the method, how it occurred could have been different. But fasting as a concept was something that was required. And this also shows the greatness of fasting. Because if it wasn't great, Allah never would have said every nation had to do it. So that shows the importance of fasting. And then in the final part of this ayah, Allah says, so be, perhaps you become mindful of Allah. It's through Allah's mercy that he tells us why we have to do certain things. Because Allah didn't have to tell us that. Allah didn't have to give us that guidance. He tells us that the purpose of fasting is for Muslims in, to be able to develop spiritually. So that they become God-fearing. And Allah did not tell us to fast to punish us. He Rather, it's to help us. And Allah knows us best. He knows what's good for us. And so that's why he prescribed fasting for us. And then, so there's this set of ayahs in Surah Baqarah where fasting is talked about. And so this is the next. So in For those who can only fast with extreme difficulty, compensation can be made by feeding a needy person for every day not fasted. But whoever volunteers to give more is better for them, and to fast is better for you if you only knew. Here we see the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That fasting is only for this small period of time. It's only for these 30 days that you're required to do it. And it's only, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about all the different people who don't have to fast, the people who are ill, the people who are on a journey, they don't have to fast. And then Allah says that if you if it's extremely difficult for you, here's what you do instead. Again, through Allah's mercy, He's not telling us like, "Hey, you're extremely sick and you have to fast and you might die as a result of fasting, but you still have to do it." No, Allah says, "Hey, they, this could be harmful to you, and so as a result, do this instead. Feed a needy person." What I really love about this ayah is the positive encouragement that Allah does here. He says. You know, he talks about whoever is ill or on a journey, then let them fast an equal number of days. And he goes on and on, but at the end he says, it is better for them. And to fast is for better for you, if you only knew. And again, this is a, this is a loving, positively encouraging, encouraging us to do something good. Um, there was... So whoever is present this month, let them fast. But whoever is ill or on a journey, then let them fast an equal number of days after Ramadan. Allah intends ease for you, not hardship, so that you may complete the prescribed period and proclaim the greatness of Allah for guiding you, and perhaps you will be grateful. There's a couple of themes I want to touch upon in this ayah. The first is we've talked a lot about Allah's mercy, 
And you see that again in this ayah where Allah is talking about those who are ill or on a journey and so on. I think the next one on here is Allah intends ease for you and not hardship. Allah does not want this to be difficult. Allah does not, is not looking to punish us for fasting. He wants ease for us. And then Allah says here at the end, um, Allah, so that you can pro proclaim the greatness of Allah for guiding you, perhaps you will be grateful. It's such a huge mercy and blessing from Allah subhanahu wa that he guided us to Islam, that he brought us to this religion. And he provided us with the Quran as guidance um, for us. And then the last thing I'll mention here is that it's Allah's justice that he says fast an equal number of days. Because Allah said, all right, for every fast that, Allah could have said, for every fast that you miss, you got to make a five or 10 or 20. Or Allah could have not, you know, said, okay, split it in half or something like that. But Allah, Allah is just, right? And Allah will, Allah only asks for what you what you missed out on. So that's so those are a couple of things that we that I wanted to mention on this ayah. And we only, we have I think two more ayahs perhaps and then we'll take a break in like seven or eight minutes. What is what is the what is the outcome for the fasting that you do? What is the goal? What is what happens at the end of all of this? Allah tells us, when my servants ask you, O Prophet, about me, I am truly near. I respond to the one's prayer when they when they call upon me. So let them respond with obedience to me and believe in me. Perhaps they will be guided to the right way. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. Allah you know, it, would, it seems kind of random that in the middle of a bunch of ayahs, like you'll see in the next ayah about Ramadan, Allah inserts this ayah in here about dua. In essence, this is about praying to Allah. And he's saying here a couple things. The first is that when, 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 when we turn to Allah and we raise our hands and we ask Allah, He comes close to us. He's ready to hear us. He wants to listen to us. And then he says, I respond to one's prayer when they call upon me. That is a guarantee from Allah. That is a promise from Allah. That when you turn to Allah and you ask Allah for something, he will respond to you. And so then we have a responsibility as well. Our responsibility is to turn to Allah with obedience. And we have a responsibility to believe in him. And then perhaps that will allow us to be guided to the right way. Allah is the only, is the only one who will never tire of us asking. Like, I can go to a friend and I can ask him for $5, and I can ask him again for $5, and I can ask him next time for 10 and 20 and 30 and 40. And at some point, that friend's going to be like, dude, stop asking me for money. I don't have money. Right? But Allah is the only one who, when you ask, it's an affirmation of your faith to ask Allah. And He never tires of asking. And He tells us in this ayah that I will respond when you ask ask of him. And so then this last ayah, um, I think this is lost. Ayah. It may be permissible for you to be intimate with your wives during the nights preceding the fast, 
Your spouses are a garment for you as you are for them. Allah knows you are deceiving yourselves. So he has accepted your repentance and pardoned you. So now you may be intimate with them and seek what Allah has prescribed for you. You may eat and drink until you see the light of dawn breaking the darkness of night. Then complete the fast until nightfall. And do not be intimate with your spouses while you are meditating in the mosques. These are the limits set by Allah, so do not exceed them. This is how Allah makes his revelations clear to people so that they may become mindful. The background behind this ayah is that when fasting was first revealed to the Muslims, Basically, the way it would work is that once you fell asleep, you could not eat, drink, um, and, and, and do all of the things. So let's say, for example, you open, you broke your fast at 8 p.m. and you fell asleep at 9 p.m. At that moment, you have to then fast all the way until the next day when you were able to break your fast again. And the companions found that really difficult. They found that really hard to do. There was one companion, um, Barab bin Azib, he said that um, it was, sorry, there was a companion, his name was Qais ibn Sarma al-Ansari. He came home one day after a really hard day of work. And the time for iftar had come, but he just knocked out. He fell asleep. And so he would, he now had to basically um, fast again for the rest of the, for throughout the next day. And when he, when he was finally able to, like, when he went to work the next day and stuff like that, he basically fainted. And, th and that's just how fasting used to be. The moment you fell asleep, you would have to continue your fast. And then, what a lot of, I think what's important here in this ayah, again, is this idea of mercy. Allah recognized that that was really hard for the companions. And so he modified fasting for us. To the point where now you can eat from the time of Maghrib all the way until the time of Fajr and do whatever you need to do, and that's through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it shows that Allah is merciful to us and that He, he doesn't require more than we can bear. Um, we got about 13 minutes. Um, maybe we'll continue for like five more minutes and then we can take a break. So the question becomes okay, we've talked a lot about fasting. How do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is a really long hadith. hadith. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is a famous hadith. It's called the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. And basically what happened is that Jibreel came in the form of a man to the Prophet so and he started asking a bunch of questions to the Prophet. And, you know, the, the Prophet talks about um, belief. He talks about the various acts of deeds that we're supposed to do. He talks about spirituality and ex excellence of spirituality. And then he talks about the last day. But what he mentions here, kind of right in the middle there, is that Jabril asked, and, and Jabril did this to teach the, teach the companions all about Islam. And so it mentions here in the middle that the man said, oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. And so the Prophet said, Islam is to testify that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, to establish prayer, to give charity, to fast in the month of Ramadan, and to perform the pilgrimage to the house if a way is possible. So these are the acts of worship that we are required to do. And if we kind of diagram this out, all of the acts of worship, or what Hadith Jabril talks about are, are in, in essence four things. Belief, um, Islam or fiqh, or how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spirituality, and the last day. And so, what we've talked about so far, at least, in just by covering the ayahs, we've talked about the belief part of it, in the sense that fasting is, is required for us to do. And we've talked a little bit about the last day, when we talked about how all of our deeds are going to be basically, our, all of our bad deeds are going to be obliterated through fasting. So, what, what I'm hoping to do for, we'll talk a lot more about this, but um, we'll talk about like the goal of fasting, um, and we'll talk about the fiqh of it as well. So I think maybe this is a good place to pause and take a break for 10 minutes, maybe pray longer, give people opportunity to make wudu if they want to make wudu. When we get back, we're going to talk about the goal of fasting. We'll talk a lot about taqwa, and then we'll kind of get into the fiqh of it as well. Um, does anyone have any questions, anything that you guys want to talk about? Um, I'll mention here, I brought a bunch of resources that you can check out, various books that I've um, referenced in putting together this presentation, books that I've used. 
but you're welcome to look at these and take pictures, buy them, support them. But yeah, you can take a look at that. So um, we will pause there and get your Ovalee or fasting is prescribed for you as it was for those before you, and we talked about side. So perhaps you become mindful of Allah. Ramadan focus us, focuses us to be mindful, to have this awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and we'll talk a lot about what this concept of taqwa means, but basically it forces us to be sincere in our actions. It forces us to basically when we do an action or we, when we worship Allah, we do it solely for Allah's sake. Um, we have to realize that we've become really, you know, the culture that we live in is one in which we are basically like completely ruled by our desires. Our desires kind of guide all of the actions that we do. We, we eat when we want to eat, we sleep when we want to sleep, we get on social media when we want to get on social media, and that really has an effect on our character. But Ramadan asks us to break away from those things, to break away, to break those chains of desires that we have, and it allows us to focus on developing this relationship with Allah. It helps us overpower Satan in his attempts to deceive us, and it helps us to become more empathetic as human beings. Because we realize when we fast, again, we empathize with those who don't have enough food. When we fast, we empathize with those who aren't, who don't have the blessings that we have. But at the core of it all, again, it comes back to this idea of being mindful of a law. So the, yeah, so you guys can hear, hear me, right? Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Oh, all right, sorry. So it, it forces us to, um, Ramadan, the goal of it is to attain taqwa or to attain piety. What is taqwa? What is piety? Taqwa is a concept that basically means to protect or to preserve something. And with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means that you, you, you have this beautiful thing of Islam. And you have this beautiful soul that Allah has given you. And so you protect your soul from anything that can corrupt it, from anything that distracts it from, from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you, you fear Allah, um, whether you, you fear Allah in all of the different aspects of your life. Um, the st scholars have described this concept of taqwa as basically foundational in our faith. And again, it's not a new concept to Islam only. Um, other nations before us were combined, co commanded to be mindful of Allah. And so the essence of taqwa is to put a barrier or a guard between your soul and what can negatively affect it and, um, and things that will negatively affect it in order to protect it. Um, Umar, ibn al, Umar ibn al Khattab, he asked another companion, Ubay ibn Ka'af, what is taqwa? He asked him for the meaning of it. And Ubay basically replied and he said, oh, and Umar knew what taqwa was. Like, I mean, he knew what taqwa was. But he's just asking, right? And so he wants to get his take on it. And so he said, oh, commander of the believers, what would you do if you walked on a thorny road? So Umar said, I would raise up my garment and I would be conscious. So basically what he's saying is like, you know when you're walking through like a bunch of bushes that are thorny, you're gonna raise up your pants because you don't want your pants to get all messed up or your shirts to get messed up, or sorry, your, your, your body to get messed up or whatever. And you're kind of gonna step like super carefully as you're going through that area. And so that's what he says here. He says, I would raise my garment and be cautious to not let my clothes get entangled in the thorns and strive not to step on one of them. And so Ubay ibn Qab, he said, this is taqwa. It's that idea that you are cautious of the steps that you're taking, cautious of the steps that you are taking, distancing yourself from Allah. One of the things that um, uh, Osama mentioned was that a guy came to Imam Sahib Web and he asked him, you know, I feel distant from Allah. And we talked about this last night. And Imam Sahib responded to him and said, well, who moved? Allah didn't move. So you moved. You distance yourself from Allah. And so taqwa is this idea that you are careful in the things that you are doing because you recognize the impact that it'll have on you. One of the scholars of the song, Ibn Jazay al qawbi he said that the key to attaining taqwa, the key to attaining piety revolves around 10 things. And I'm not gonna mention each one of these here, but what I wanna point out is that Ramadan encompasses all of these 10 things. When we fast, 
we incorporate all of these different things, whether it's that fear of punishment or hope or fear of reckoning our, of, of the good de of our deeds or feeling, um, being thankful to Allah and feeling grateful for all of the bounties that Allah has bestowed upon us. All of these various ways of attaining taqwa, Ramadan incorpor incorporates all of these into our life. So for this one month, it's kind of like a spiritual boot camp to attain piety and come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to mention a story to kind of drive home the point of taqwa. There was once a man, and a young man, and he had spent many years of his life trying to gain Islamic knowledge and pursue knowledge. And so he found a teacher. And he came to the teacher and he said, oh teacher, I am a young student of knowledge. I have devoted many years to learning about this faith. But I find it hard to lower my gaze, meaning that he constantly was being tempted to look at the opposite gender. I find it hard to lower my gaze. And I, so he said, I've come from far away because I want you to teach me taqwa and to solve this problem of mine. And so the teacher looked at the kid and he said, if you're truly a person of knowledge, then you have to realize that nothing is achieved without sacrifice. So if I'm going to teach you about piety, I'm going to teach you about taqwa and being aware of Allah, you have to do something for me. you got to do something for me as a result of that. You have to, we have this concept in, um, in, in, in Desi culture called Pitma, I think most, 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 most cultures have it, this idea of like serving someone, serving your guests, serving your parents, serving your elders, things like that, Pitma. And so the guy said, all right, yeah, I agree, I can do that. You know, uh, if you're gonna help me fix this, I'm gonna do that. And so the teacher said, every day, I'm gonna give you a bowl of milk. And I want you to take this bowl of milk to, this, to one of my friends on the opposite end of the town. But you have to be careful because I don't want you to drop any of this milk because he needs that. He, this is his meal, basically. And so you're going to take this milk and you're going to walk it to, the, to my friend. And the teacher goes, don't rush because if you rush, you'll have to walk through the entire town and you, know, I, you might drop some. And I'm going to send someone to watch over you to make sure that you don't spill any of this milk. And so then the guy was like, all right, I'm, okay, so he started, he handed the man the bowl, and he started going, he started going towards, towards his friend, his teacher's friend. And so he walks through the town, and he's like nervous, and he's like studying, and he's like trying to balance his bowl of milk, which is like filled to the brim, and he's trying to go, and he, he goes all the way to the teacher, and he gives the milk. And then he goes back, or to the friend, he gives the milk, and then he goes back to the teacher. And so then the teacher says, you know, okay, what exact roads did you take to get to my friend? And the guy goes, I have no idea. I wasn't even paying attention to the roads. I was trying to make sure I don't drop any milk. So then the teacher asks, well, did you notice, as you walked through the marketplace, did you notice such and such? Did you notice this shop or that shop? The teacher student goes, no. He had, did you notice my cousin who's on the way to, when you pass the bridge? You would have noticed this, the largest house in the neighborhood. You said no. Did you notice the garden that was that you had to go through in order to get to my friend's house? He said no. He said, I didn't notice any of those things because I was too worried that I was going to spill the milk and that, I, and that you were going to scold me. But I assure you that if I didn't have that bowl, I would have been better able to describe any of those things. So then the teacher said, now you understand what that was. Dakwa is this idea that you are careful as you're traversing this world, making sure that this important thing that you have in your hands, your soul, is, 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 is not corrupted as you travel through this world. And so then the guy goes, you know, the teacher goes, okay, the student goes, okay, but how does that help me control my sight, my gaze? And so then the teacher says that bowl of milk was your good deed. And just as you are too concerned about spilling the bowl of milk, you have to be concerned about your book of good deeds and be concerned about how about making about getting to a lost combo with your soul uncorrupted. So it's, it's a you know silly story, but it highlights an important point that we as we go through this world, sometimes we become focused on other than a lost combo. And sometimes it takes things like hardship that we go through, or 
but yearly thing like Ramadan to bring us back to Allah, to reorient our lives back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's kind of what taqwa is. I'll pause there for a moment in case you guys have any questions because the next thing that we're going to start talking about is the fiqh of Ramadan based on the Hanafi school. So if you guys have any questions, um, take one or two. But this is the part that's going to get a lot of, this isn't going to get technical. So, all right. Uh, I don't see any questions, so this is not. Ibn al-Jazi said, By Allah, if the dead were asked to make one wish, they would have wished for another day to have in Ramadan. That's how significant it was to them. Or that's how significant it is for all of us. If we could have anything after we pass away, we would be to have one more day in Ramadan. And again, when we, I keep coming back to this ayah because it's so pivotal. Allah says, Believe, O believers, fasting is prescribed for you. So Allah is telling us it's an obligation. It's something that you have to do. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Islam is built upon five. To worship Allah and to disbelieve in what is worshipped besides him. To establish prayer, to give charity, to perform the Hajj, Hajj pilgrimage to the house, and to fast the month of Ramadan. And so fasting is one of the pillars of this faith. It's something that if we don't do, we cannot claim that we have full faith um, or that we've fully believed. Why is this important for you as an individual? Why, why do I have to cover the ins and outs of fasting for you as an individual? All knowledge is divided into what's called fard al and fard al meaning those things that are obligatory on you as an individual to do, far and then those that are obligatory upon the community to do. So you as an individual, you have to know how to fast. You as an individual have to know how to pray. You as an individual have to know how to perform hajj if Allah blesses you to perform hajj and you're able to do so. You have to know how to do those things because you will be held individually accountable for that. And we as a community, and this is the beauty, beautiful thing about Islam, is that there are certain things that the community is accountable for. So for example, when someone passes away, if we as a community have to make sure that we pray upon that individual, and if we don't pray upon that individual, all of us are held accountable for that. And so all knowledge is divided into things that you are individually held accountable for, and we as a community are individually held accountable for as well. So, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet sallallahu said, follow the right course, be devoted, and give glad tidings. Verily, none of you will enter paradise by your deeds alone. And so they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, not even me, unless Allah grants me his mercy. Know that the most beloved deed to Allah is that which is done regularly, even if it's small. Our relationship with Allah is not a transactional relationship. It's not one that, you know, you do this, 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 and you're required to do all of this. At the end of the day, our relationship with Allah is a relationship based on love. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so because we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do what he asked us to do. And at the end of the day, if we make mistakes, if we mess up, at the end of the day, it's Allah's mercy that will get us to Jannah. And this, and the proof of the put, the proof of the pudding is in this hadith. The, the Prophet was the best worshiper of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and yet he recognized that it's not his deeds alone that are going to get him to Jannah. It's Allah's love and His mercy that will get him there. And so I want to make sure that we, I mentioned that up front that we worship Allah because we love Him, and Allah asked us to worship Him because He loved us. And so that's the foundation of all of the worship that we do. So let's talk about fasting. Again, to break it down, Siam is, is fasting, and it's composed of saw, wow, and meat. And Siam comes from the, from the root, which means to abstain, to, to, to stop doing something. Abstain from what? This is kind of a technical definition of fasting, or a legal definition of fasting. Fasting is to withhold from eating, drinking, and sexual intercourse during daylight hours with the intention of fasting performed by one capable and required to do so. There is a lot of stuff in that simple de simple definition that we'll talk about as we go through the signs. And again, just to reiterate, 
Um, what I'm presenting to you today is from the Hanafi fiqh perspective. There's different schools of thought, there's slight differences in how, and you know, various technicalities, but um, what I've studied and what I'm presenting is from the Hanafi perspective. So, fasting is actually an interesting um, act of worship because their fasting compo uh, there's different types of fasting. There's obligatory fasting. So, what's an example of an obligatory fast? What do you guys think? Uh -huh. Ramadan, exactly. Um, what's an example of a wajib fast or mandatory, meaning you have to do it? Makeup fast. Makeup fast, good. What's an example of a sunnah fast that you don't have to do but you're rewarded for? Mondays and Thursdays. Mondays and Thursdays, okay, good. Um, that's actually, uh, I guess you could say that's also sunnah or it's recommended. The recommended ones are the three white days, um, fasting on the 13th, 14th, and 15th. There's voluntary fast, which is any fast that you do. What is, so in the Hanafi Madhub, there's two different categories of disliked. There's prohibitively disliked and mildly disliked. What is an example of something that you could say is closer to haram than it is halal? Um, what is something that's prohibitively disliked to do? Fasting the So, a couple things. So, fasting the day of Eid is prohibitively disliked. Fasting the days of Hajj is prohibitively disliked. You're not supposed to do that. Fasting every day is actually mildly disliked. So it's you shouldn't do it. Or for example, if you say I'm going to fast choose every Tuesday for the rest of my life, that's mildly disliked because you're not supposed to specify it. Um, there's different various rules associated with all of these different types of fasting. But for the purpose of today, I'm just going to talk about the obligatory Ramadan fast because we don't have time to talk about everything else. Um, so just keep that in mind as we're discussing it. But if you if, if you make it a habit of doing some of these other fasts, then there are different rules associated with that that you should look into. So who is required to fast? And we talked a little bit about this, like in terms of like the ayahs that we discussed. But you have to be Muslim, a man or a woman who's not on their period, or postnatal bleeding after they've given birth to a baby. You have to be healthy. You have to be an adult, meaning that you've, ha you've passed puberty. Sane, you have to be a resident, meaning that if you're a traveler, you don't have to fast. And you have to have an intention to fast. So if you wake up and you just don't eat, that's, and we'll talk a lot about int intention in a second, but you have to have the intention to fast. But these are the people that are required too fast. When do you fast? So we are required to fast starting from this time, which is an astronomical dawn. So there's there was a calendar that was that I, I had seen a little bit earlier. Um, this time, astronomical dawn, is different than sunrise. It comes before sunrise. It's the time when Fajr prayer enters. So we're we're required to fast from astronomical dawn all the way until sunset, which is the end of time, so, or the end time, which is sunset. So it's this kind of daylight hour period. Um, so, and I mentioned here the last third of the night is the best time for down. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, but this, what's inter this also kind of covers like the different um, times that you're supposed to pray and stuff like that. So you have this in your slides as well. So we talked about so far who's required to fast. We've talked about when you're required to fast. Now we're gonna talk about the intention. So the first thing to note about the intention is that intention is something that's in the heart and in the mind. It's not something that you have to verbalize. It's not something that you have to say out loud. It's in the heart and mind. And in the Hanafi Madhab, um, they divide, so you have to make the intention during a specific time period. And the Hanafi month is actually a lot easier. Well, it's maybe the second easiest in this regard. The um, Maliki month says that you make the intention once at the beginning of the month and you're fine. Um, the the Shafi month says that you have to do it within a certain period of time as well. And then the Hanafi month also says a certain period of time. So you have to make an intention to fast every day between, so between Sunset to the mid before the middle of the day, basically. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. But if I go back to this slide, 
So once this time period comes, sunset, you have to make an intention that you are going to fast the next set of daylight hours. You do it from this period of time all the way until Ashramic dawn is the best time to do it. But you actually have a little bit more leeway to somewhere in this period of time. You have to have that intention of fasting during Ramadan. This is one area where when we were talking about the types of fasting, there's a little bit of difference in the different types of fasting and the intention. But for the purposes of Ramadan, you have until the middle of the day. And I do that in air quotes for a meeting or for a purpose. Um, if you're making up fasts, the intention has to be made any time between Maghrib and when the um, when Fajr starts. What do I mean by the middle of the day? So this is where things get a little bit interesting or complicated or however you want to calculate it or say it. But so I looked up that I looked up the prayer times for the sixth of Ramadan in Alexandria, Virginia, coming up here um, in a week or two. So Fajr comes in at six oh six and Mulgar comes in at seven seventeen PM. That time period is thirteen hours and eleven minutes. So this is like super technical. Right, I I I want to I want I'm mentioning it for a specific reason, but it's like really technical. So you take those 13 hours and 11 minutes, you divide it by two. That's six hours and 36 minutes. You take that. So then, so we're, again, we're trying to figure out what is before the middle of the day. You take the budget time, you add six hours and 36 minutes to it, and you get 12:42 p.m. So. What the Hanafi Madhab is allowing you to do is, let's say, for example, you you broke your fast at Maghrib time, and then you you ate whatever you wanted to eat, and you slept, and you slept all the way to Fajr time, without thinking that you're going to fast the next day. As an example, you actually have until 12:42 p.m. on the sixth day of Ramadan to make that intention to fast. And if you didn't make that intention to fast, then you miss that fast. Um, this is actually, you know, in I'll note here, normally people think middle of the day is noon, or they think that it's over time, but you can see there's a clear difference between the two. It's actually maybe about 30 minutes around there, something like that, before the over time. But you have that entire time period to um, make the intention to fast if you wanted to. And like I said, this is really technical, but it's important to mention that. But why is the Hanafi Matab telling you to do this? The reason why they, they specify before the middle of the day here is because they want you to spend the majority of the day fasting with an intention. You know, intentionality is something that I think is a little bit in vogue. Like people talk about intentionality and let's be intentional and stuff like that in everything that we do. But intentionality is something that was part of our religion from the very beginning. And so what they're trying to tell us here is that let's make sure that when you're doing this act of worship, you're doing it intentionally for the majority of the day. And so that's why they came up with this calculation. And I know it's like it's, it's really technical, but, um, but I wanted to mention that. And I think that's pretty cool that you know, they, want, they want us to have that intention for the majority of the day. Are there any questions about this? Because I know this was like super. Oh, so like some, some Go ahead. So I'm thinking like a lot of um, people just tell us like start Ramadan with the intention that you're going to fast all of Ramadan. Does that not count? It depends. Like if you like, so there's other schools of thought that allow that. Like the Maliki Muslim allows that. The Maliki say that you begin the entire month with the intention to fast and you're fine. Um, if you, you know, I think. I think it's important to, like, you know, maybe decide on like a method that you want to follow and follow it consistently. And if that's what you did in the past, then it's fine. But you know that you know I don't. I think that I think it's important that you know you're consistent with the way that you worship more than anything else. I will mention, and I <laughs> I have this here as a note of caution. Um, Satan, Shaitan, will play with your intentions. He will make you doubt 
that you intended properly. He will make you doubt that you didn't set an intention. He will, intention is one of the areas that he likes to play. And so this is not like super complicated. Like, you know, if for example, you wake up for Sahur, the fact that you're waking up for Sahur is an intention, right? Like if you thought to yourself at any fleeting moment at night that, hey, yeah, tomorrow's another day of fasting, you know, I gotta be checked fast, that's it. It doesn't have to be super complicated or something that like is like really intense. Like it's just a, it's a moment of time where you thought that you were gonna fast. Um, and so just keep that in mind as well because intentions are the gardens where Satan plays. There was another question. Thank you. If you forgot to make intention until the middle of the day, is there any kapara or punishment? Let me look into that. Um, I need to let me let me just double check that. Because I always forget to intention because I do you wake up for Sahur though? Yeah. Um, so that's your intention. Yeah, because because again, the fact that you're waking up for Sahur is an intention in and of itself. Um, but let me double check that question. I'm just gonna write it down here. At the next break, I'll try to look into that. Yeah. Is there like a certain law or something you're supposed to say? No, there's nothing. There's no nothing you have to say. It's it, it, again, it's in the heart and in the mind. Um, there, scholars in the past did like prescribe certain duas to say and stuff like that. And it's more of a tool more than anything else to just again bring your focus to the intention. But there's nothing specifically you have to say. So, so now, let's talk about the actions of a fasting person. There are certain things that we're recommended to do. There's certain things that don't break the fast. There's certain things that are macro or re reprehensible to do. And then there's certain things that invalidate the fast. And then of that category, there are certain things that require makeup and certain things that require makeup and expiation. So we're gonna talk about all these. What I'm gonna present, um, and this is gonna be a lot of text. I don't generally like doing a lot of text. I like diagrams and graphics and stuff, but it's gonna be a lot of text. But what I'll mention up front is that the list that I'm providing you and that what we're gonna go through is not an exhaustive list of things. Um, I've tried to hit the highlights and the most you know, common things that could occur, but there's other things like, for example, some thick books say if you unintentionally walk through a flour mill and you get flour, like what happens? Like, you know, like I, 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 I mean, you know, I think, I, I, I'm not gonna talk about all that basically. So what do you do when a kebab bag falls in your mouth and like suddenly, like, I mean, if you chewed it and you ate it, that would be one thing if it fall, fell into your mouth and you swallowed it and made it. Like, 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 you're fine, I love providing it. <laughs> I really have a good time. Yeah, so I mean like I mean like that's the thing, like so let's talk about things that you're recommended to do as a fasting person during the month. You are recommended to eat sahur. Um sahur, the Prophet said is blessed, and there's blessings that come with it. So make sure that you eat sahur. And what's interesting is that you're actually recommended to delay sahur up until a few minutes before the time of fajr comes. The idea here is that you have nourishment for like the majority, the, the fast that's upcoming. So don't eat so word like, I mean you could, but like it's like, don't eat so word like two hours before your fasting is supposed to start, like delay it as much as you can to, to be nourished throughout the whole fast. And then interestingly, you're recommended to break your fast as soon as mother comes in. So the moment mother comes in, break your fast. That, you, you're rewarded for that. Guard your tongue from lies, from backbiting, from slander, from swearing. So make sure that you control what you say. You're recommended to guard your gaze, um, looking at the opposite gender, things like that. Avoid getting angry. And then you're recommended to engage in acts of worship, like reading the Quran, making dhikr, um, praying extra. These are all recommended things to do for the person who's fasting. Let's talk about what doesn't break the fast. So if you forgetfully eat, drink, or have relations with your spouse, 
that does not break the fast. So if you forgetfully, and this happens often during like the first like one or two days of Ramadan, like if you're just like going to the water pool, you're having some water, just drink, drink, drink it. It does not break your fast, but in your in uh, um, the hadith that Prophet says that Allah blessed you with food as a result of that. So that does not break your fast. If you wake up and you have like a wet dream or something like that, or you're in a state of ritual impurity, that does not break your fast. Kissing one's spouse is, does not break your fast, but be careful. Um, medicinal injections don't break the fast. Using a miswak or toothpaste or toothbrush does not break the fast, but again, don't let yourself swallow that. Vomiting, as long as you don't swallow the vomit, does not break the fast. And eating food that's stuck in one's mouth that's smaller than a chicken. So let's say, for example, you're eating sahur, and the time to start fasting comes, and then you know you make wudu, you pray, and you realize, oh, actually, you accidentally ate a little bit of food that was stuck in your teeth. As long as it's smaller than a chickpea, it does not break your fast. And again, this is not an exhaustive list of things, but I just wanted to give you some examples of things that don't break your fast. What is reprehensible to do? Uproot. Um, it's makru, reprehensible, to taste something, providing nothing reaches the throat, due to the possibility of swallowing what is being tasted. So you want to avoid doing that. Chewing gum, provided it has no flavor, sugar, or other substance that reaches the throat. I don't know why you chew gum then, but that, there's that. To backbite. Staying in a state of ritual impurity for the entire day, major ritual impurity for the entire day, and then needlessly undergoing any action that will weaken the body, making it difficult to fast. So for example, the last one there, let's say you're in the habit of giving blood donations. Probably don't want to do that during Ramadan because it's something that's going to weaken you, as an example. Um, plasma donations, as an example. Some people get cupping done regularly. That's an example of something you shouldn't do that would weaken the body. So anything that would weaken the body. Another example would be, let's say, you um, play like an extreme amount of soccer or football or something like that while you're fasting. You probably don't want to do that because it'll weaken the body. Again, the idea here with all of these things is you want to avoid things that are potentially going to force you to break your fast. So for example, if you're tasting food, Sometimes we just involuntarily then just swallow the food because we're tasting it and you want to avoid doing that. Or you weaken your body to such an extent that you have to break your fast because it's so weak. All right. Now we'll talk about the category of things that you absolutely want to avoid. In things that will invalidate your fast. But before we talk about it, the Prophet said, if anyone breaks his fast, um, one day in Ramadan, without a concession or without being ill, a perpetual fast, you will not atone for it, even if you observed it. I mean, what, what the Prophet is saying here is that if you did something that intentionally broke your fast, you could fast for the rest of your life, and you would never be able to make up the fast that you lost, that you missed out on for that one day. That's how serious this is. Um, so when we talk about things that invalidate the fast, again, there's two categories. There's things that will invalidate the fast and require makeup, but not in expiation. Expiation is a uh, Muslim word. There's Muslim words out there. Um, but it's a Muslim word that, like ablution, like that's a Muslim word. But expiation as a word basically means that there's not an extra act that you have to do to make up for, or to, to atone for that. Um, for what you did. So this is a category of things that just require you to make up the day. So a fasting person breaks their fast for a reason that the Sharia permits. So let's say, for example, you're sick. You started fasting, you were feeling fine, and then all, let's say, um, you got extremely dehydrated for some reason. And you had to basically drink water and electrolytes and whatever. But you had to break your fast as, as a result of that, you don't have to pay, you don't have to atone for that, but you do have to make up for that day. Or eating something that's not normally eaten, like for example, rocks, as an example. I don't know why you do that, but let's say you ate rocks because you just, were just so hungry, you just ate a rock to cure your hunger. That's something that you have to make up. 
Um, eating mistakenly, thinking that there's still time for some work, or mugger came in when it didn't. So this sometimes happens again in the early days of fasting. Let's say you were eating some work, eating some work, and you kept eating some work because you thought that Fudger was coming in 10 minutes um, later, and it didn't. Fudger had already come in, you were still eating. You would have to make up that day. Or let's say you broke your fast because, like, so my, my, um, my prayer app is guidance, as you can see here, and sometimes it's really annoying because I have to open it in order for it to refresh the location that I'm at. So let's say, for example, I, it's set to my home location of Laurel, and I come here to Alexandria. There could be a minute or two difference between those two times. Let's say, for example, I'm thinking, it's saying, okay, Maghreb is in based on the time of Laurel, and I'm here in Alexandria, and so I broke my fast thinking it was Laurel, and then when I open the app, it's like, oh, I still had a minute to go. That's um, the second scenario, where Mugger came in when it did it. Um, purposely vomiting a mouthful. Water that you use for making wudu that's mistakenly swallowed. Or if you are um, kissing or touching your spouse or whatever, and excuse me for the for saying this, but like if um, for a man's semen were to come out, then that's something that would make up that you would um, have to make up, but you wouldn't have to atone for it. Again, the Prophet said that if you invalidate your fast, you could fast for the rest of your life, and you'll never be able to make up that day. But you still have to make up the day that you miss. But the value, the reward of it, you'll never be able to make up for that. And then this category is the danger zone. You do not want to be in this scenario. Um, and we'll talk about why in a second, but you want to avoid this like the plague. So you want to avoid deliberately eating, deliberately eating, uh, drinking, deliberately taking medication without a valid excuse. So what that what's meant there is, let's say for example, um, you are prescribed, I don't know, like an IV or something like that, and you don't have to take the IV, but you take the IV anyway. Like, that would be taking medicine without a valid excuse. What's not meant here is if you're feeling sick, like you started fasting and you feel sick, like, and you just broke your fast to take your medicine, that's not what's described here. This is taking medicine without a valid excuse. Kissing, or sorry, having intercourse or smoking. These are all things that require a makeup and you have to atone for that sin in this world so that you are not held accountable for it in the next world. And it's actually really difficult to do. If you are, if you do one of these things, it's what you have to do in order to hold yourself to account in this world for that, is the first thing you have to do is either you have to free a slave, and there's slavery is not a thing anymore, right? So then the next thing you have, the next option that you have is you have to fast for two consecutive months. And what's meant by that is that if you if anything happens that requires you to restart that, like or sorry, anything happens that requires you to have a break other than for women on their period and stuff like that, you have to restart those two months. So let's say for example you're fasting, you're fasting, and you break your fast for whatever reason. You have to restart those two months. And if you're not able to do that, then you feed 64 people two meals. This is a top to down, top down. If you're you're not going to find slaves to free. So if you deliberately ate or drank during Ramadan, you have to fast for two consecutive months. Let's say, for example, you're frail, you're old, whatever. If you're not able to fast two consecutive months, then you have to feed 60 poor people two meals a day. You don't have the option of those two. It's not optional which one you do. You have to either fast two months, and if you're not able to do so, you have to feed 60 poor people two meals. That's why it's incredibly important that you don't enter the danger zone. You don't, that, and that's why the Hanafi Madhab also says that these things are mapru to do. So tasting something, that, uh, um, I think the other one was like kissing and stuff like that. Like you don't want to be in that scenario because it's incredibly difficult to atone for that and to hold yourself to account for that in this world so that you're not held accountable in the hereafter as a result. Um, 
Any questions? Fix not so bad. That, that's actually all the fix there is, actually. So the most important thing I'll say out of everything that I've covered here, or two, two important things, is first of all, your intention. Make sure that your intention is right every day. Um, and then make sure that you completely avoid invalidating it fast, because that's not a scenario you want to be in. So the slide that was uh, two slides before this one, so the one that invalidates your fast. But this one? Yes. Is this is this list like specific to Penelope's from what you know, or is this like generally the same throughout the schools? Um, I think, I mean, this is definitely what the Hanafi Mathub says. I don't know about other schools and what they would say. Mm -hmm. I think some of them are true across the other schools. So for example, um, like for example, if you have to break your fast due to sickness, fainting, or traveling, I think all the schools say that you have to make that day up. Um, I'm not sure about eating something that's not normally e eaten, or I think all the schools also say eating mistakenly, thinking that there's still time you have to make that day up. Um, so for that one, I asked, actually have a different question. So for that one, like, doesn't that come under, like, eating mistakenly doesn't break your fast? Because it's technically, you didn't know? Or is so that there, so it's funny you mentioned that. There's a difference between mistaken and forgetful. Oh, okay. Yeah. So forgetful means that you just didn't, like, you just forgot. Yeah. Versus mistaken means that you didn't do your due diligence. Mm -hmm. To, to account for that. And so there's a difference there that the Hanafi Mata um, mentions. Okay. Did you have a question? 